There was a time long ago on planet Earth that lasted from 359 million years ago to 299 million years ago. This age is known as the Carboniferous, a world that was like a giant wetland or endless rainforest. But the Carboniferous is now one of our primary sources of energy today. Fossil fuels are taken from deposits with coal and natural gas, which mainly date to that time long ago. This lost world from before the dinosaurs is just like a science fiction novel. The rivers and waterways were infested with ancient amphibians lurking in the depths, as well as predatory fish. The land was dominated by the early reptiles, as well as other larger amphibians at that time. This ancient world already sounds like a fairy tale, but quickly becomes a nightmare for some as you look back at the kings of the Carboniferous. Giant griffin flies, millipedes, and the last of the sea scorpions, alongside other giant insects, ruled the world. Hello, my name is Atrix, guardian of the natural order, and this is the Carboniferous. The Carboniferous period takes place in the Paleozoic era, a time before the dinosaurs, and lasted for 60 million years. The environment was tropical, wet, and humid like swamps today. Imagine anywhere that was land was dominated by bayous and ridiculous amounts of foliage covering the forest floor. To put it simply, planet Earth was practically an endless stretch of forests and wetlands. The plants, which were widespread across the world, included early relatives of conifers, horsetails, ferns, and scaled, pole-like trees which grew up to 132 feet. These trees are plants known as lycopsids, and today, they can only grow to a few centimeters. Above the ocean critters in the air was an atmosphere that was especially different in comparison to our atmosphere today. This was due to plants becoming more prevalent on land in the period before the Carboniferous, known as Devonian. The Carboniferous is that jumping off point after the Devonian, when plants quickly spread across land. This had an effect on the atmosphere, which at the time had much as 35% oxygen in the 50 million years of the Carboniferous. Today, we have 20% of oxygen in our atmosphere. The atmosphere evidently made a world much warmer and humid than our own today. In the land of the Carboniferous, the forest grounds and many water systems present were taken over by the most recent newcomers to the land. These were amphibians, small and large, and some still primarily remained in the water. These are two kinds of amphibians that are present in the Carboniferous waterways, both adapted for a predatory lifestyle in water. They wait in the riverbeds to catch prey passing above them, striking fast. One of the most iconic of these amphibians of the waterways is Diplocallus. This amphibian is iconic for its boomerang-shaped head and is found in North America and Africa. It appeared for the first time at the Lake Carboniferous, and it lived throughout the following period known as the Permian, finally going extinct at the Great Dying Mass Extinction Event at 252 million years ago. Three species are known to science, and in life it was a 3.3 foot amphibian, possessing a wide, salamander-like body with a ribbon-like tail. These features show a fascinating anatomy built for maneuvering in water efficiently, even the limbs are decently reduced. In 1980, paleontologist Arthur Cruikshank and fluid dynamicist B.W. Skews reconstructed a Diplocallus model using its skull and put it through a series of aerodynamic tests in a wind tunnel. They concluded with their findings that Diplocallus was able to generate a lot of lift in water, which allowed the amphibian to rise vertically rather quickly. This combined with the fact that the mouth, while open during these tests, did not affect the generation of lift in any way, shows that Diplocallus had a significant adaptation for ambushing fish from the river sediments below. Another bizarre river amphibian from the Carboniferous period was Crasigonyrus scotus, and this ancient amphibian was equally strange as Diplocallus. 
Its bizarre anatomy made it resemble more like a giant carnivorous tadpole. Krasigoniris lurked in the depths of quiet waterways, waiting to ambush prey in similar fashion to Diplocolis. It had powerful jaws and a bone-crushing bear trap of a skull, the perfect weapon to catch unsuspecting prey. Some scientists have even compared it to the modern-day moray eel. On land, semi-aquatic amphibians ruled the water surface. These amphibians first appeared at the start of the Carboniferous, and they're known as tembospondyls. The first kinds were appearing in the waterways of the Carboniferous, like forms such as Erops and Dendurbidon. Erops was a heavily built and powerful river monster which was able to grow up to 9.3 feet. It had a row of teeth lining its strong and powerful jaws, which it used to grasp its prey and force it to the back of its mouth to digest. Erops has been found in Pennsylvania and New Mexico, and had skin made up of oval bumps. This amphibian, like Diplocolis, would live into the next period of the Paleozoic, after the Carboniferous, which is known as the Permian. Dendropidum was an early Tembospondyl and grew up to a little over a foot long. It appeared in the Carboniferous and has been found in Lycopsid trees located in Nova Scotia and Canada and Ireland. This occurrence is rather interesting, as it captures its behavior. The Carboniferous forest at the time was undergoing fires, which Dendropidum would seek shelter from like any other animal. However, when they would hide in trees to escape the fire, they are mostly consumed by the flames. Some have been observed to have survived for a period of time in the hollow trees, and this is based on fossilized dung. Four species are known to science, and in life, they would resemble giant lizard-like salamanders. This was a time when the first true reptiles appeared. Petrolacosaurus was one of them that appeared during this time. However, the very first known to science is undoubtedly Hylonomus. This small reptile was discovered in Nova Scotia, Canada, and represents a massive step in Earth's natural history. Prior to Hylonomus, eggs were laid in water systems by older amphibians in the Devonian. Examples include Tiktaalik and Ichthyostega. The water would sustain their eggs, however in the Carboniferous, Hylonomus made a breakthrough with the amniotic egg. This specific type of egg is incredibly common today in many animals. This new adaptation allowed Hylonomus to venture outside of the Carboniferous riverbanks and into its lycopsid forests. The amniotic egg possessed a protective shell, which it still does today storing nutrients connected to the embryo. Aquatic life had expanded to the bayous and waterways owned by the amphibians due to the evolutionary radiation of fish at this time. The recent diversification brought these fishes to the swamps, and a good example of this would be Orthocanthus, which was a xenocanthid shark. This family of sharks possessed unique features, which included a single spine on top of their heads and teeth possessing two to three pointed cusps used for catching prey in the waterways. The 10 foot long freshwater shark usually had a dynamic with another xenocanthid shark known as Triotis, and even at times resorted to cannibalism in times of hardship. 11 to 10 orthocanthus species exist, and it has been found in North America and Europe. Orthocanthus was not the only aquatic predator in the Carboniferous swamps. Another family of fish, specifically bony fish, known as the Rhizodontida, were also present. The biggest of this family, known as Rhizodus Huberti, can grow up to 23 feet long. Rhizodus has been found in the same region as Orthocanthus, North America and Europe. Because Rhizodus and others of its kind could grow so big, Rhizodontida were arguably one of the most successful fish families of their time in the Paleozoic. They had a menu consisting of early reptiles, amphibians, and other fish. They most likely had a specific method of hunting and feeding, which included gripping and dragging after prey when ambushed. Depending on the size, a Rhizodont fish would either thrash it at the water's surface or take it to the waterway depths to eat it without disturbance. An old enemy of the mentioned aquatic life still lurk 
and brackish and freshwater ecosystems of the Carboniferous, and have also inherited the Earth on land, becoming kinks of the period. The invertebrates of the Carboniferous mainly consisted of the last of the sea scorpions and giant millipedes, griffin flies, and other giant insects of the similar kind. Sea scorpions during this time expanded outside of the oceans and into bayous of the Carboniferous. A rare kind of sea scorpion, known as Megarachne cervini, was an example of this, first mistakenly identified as a spider. This freshwater sea scorpion lived in Argentina. Its family are only known from South Africa and Scotland, and it fed on smaller invertebrates through sweet feeding. It grew up to 21 inches, or 1.75 feet. Sea scorpions also started to breach the land during this later stage of their existence in the Paleozoic era. Hibertopateris and Adelothalmus are two examples of sea scorpions that exhibit this behavior. Hibertopateris was in the same sea scorpion family as Megarachne, and fed through sweeping feeding just like it. Hibertopateris has been found in Scotland, Ireland, the Czech Republic, and South Africa. Hibertopateris was the largest member of its sea scorpion family, able to reach up to 6.6 .6 feet, or potentially more. It too is also considered to be the more heavier of the sea scorpions. Adelophalmus is another sea scorpion that only recently has been discovered to have had a respiratory system, which it used whenever breaching land from its aquatic lifestyle. This final sea scorpion example from the Carboniferous lived through the Paleozoic for 124 million years, making it the longest living sea scorpion. Its appearance started in the beginning of the Devonian and ended in the beginning of the Permian, with its largest range being in the Carboniferous. 23 of the 33 Adelothalmus species have been discovered from just the Carboniferous, and it lived practically around the world. It has been discovered in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia, suggesting a near worldwide distribution. Size varies across specimens, however, the largest could grow to a little over a foot. Adelothalmus at this time was one of the very last sea scorpions and coexisted with the kings of the Carboniferous on land. Insects above the waters during the Carboniferous grew to massive proportions, much larger than our modern day bugs. Today, we are met by millipedes and dragonflies. However, these two forms are massive in the Carboniferous. Arthropleura was a giant millipede-like insect found in Europe and North America, and it represents the biggest terrestrial arthropod that has ever existed. Arthropleura, however, was not carnivorous and has actually been found to feed upon lycopsids and other plant material, showing its herbivorous diet. Its body was segmented and flat, reaching up to 6.56 feet or more. Meganeura appeared much more similar to our dragonflies of today, however, it wasn't a dragonfly at all. Meganeura was a massive griffinfly, a type of insect that resembled modern day dragonflies and damselflies. Meganeura was first discovered in central France, and its wingspan can grow up to 2.5 feet, representing one of the biggest flying insects of all time. Unlike Arthopleura, Meganeura was an active carnivore. They lived at the end of the Carboniferous, and mainly flew around the forest canopies hunting other insects. A final example of a big bug from the Carboniferous would be Mesiotherios from modern day Illinois of the United States. It was a large insect with a wingspan of 1.83 feet, making it one of the biggest insects known, but smaller than Meganeura. It had six wings and a mouth, which was used to puncture plants and drink their nutrients. These three insects evidently grew to massive proportions, and scientists have suggested some theories to explain this growth amongst Carboniferous insects. The main theory is that since the atmosphere was higher in oxygen levels, it helped the insects grow. However, this theory isn't substantial enough to prove it was purely responsible. Another theory is that these insects had a lack of predators, which could also be the case, as not many other animals were present on the land, outside of the first few reptiles, giant amphibians restricted to the waterways, and sea scorpions who would occasionally come to land. A final answer to why these giant bugs appeared still has to be fully revealed, as the theories presented remain debated by scientists.
The Carboniferous met its end in an event known as the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. This minor extinction event wiped out the Carboniferous Rainforest, which shrank and eventually died out completely. This event's causation is mainly attributed to changing climate and volcanic activity. The change in climate consisted of a drop in temperature, which caused the southern continent of Gondwana to practically freeze over. This hurt the rainforest greatly, which was followed by the environment becoming more arid. This process made a much more dry landscape, which greatly hurt the rainforests even more. This change in environment also affected the atmosphere. Oxygen levels dropped, and thus the big bugs went extinct. The remaining early reptiles, amphibians, and other life forms would go on to the Permian, which would be characterized by this new arid environment. Volcanic activity also could have had something to do with it, due to an eruption taking place in conjunction with the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, which also could have had a further effect on the environment. Overall, the Carboniferous period was a unique time for life. Its unique environment created a fascinating array of animals, which lived in a world consumed by foliage and bayous. It was a world where the first reptiles appeared, where amphibians stalked the waterways, and where sea scorpions and other predatory fish swam amongst the river shallows. The Carboniferous period was a time where bugs ruled as kings, only to be swept away by a changing climate, which turned into an arid time for the next period. Today, we use these ancient rainforests to power our world, extracting the remaining plant material, which over time condensed and morphed into coal, thus giving the period its name, Carboniferous, which translated mean coal bearing. Thanks for watching.